This morning, I just want to bring a simple word of encouragement to us, encouraging us in our pursuit of God, in knowing God. So I will title my message this morning as Knowing Him Intimately. It's knowing God intimately. Now, have you been following the Daily Devotions Church app? Uh, this whole week, we're talking about that. And so today is like uh, bringing it all together. Knowing Him intimately. You see, God is infinite. And none of us can ever say, I figured God out. <laughs> or I know everything there is to know about God. Or none of us can ever say, well, I've heard so much about Him. It's all old story. No, God is infinite. There is, there is no limit to how much of Him you and I can discover, learn, understand. And when we talk about knowing Him intimately, what are we saying? What are we talking about when we say to know Him intimately? First of all, we're saying we want to know who He is. What's his nature? What's his character? To know who he is. But we also are saying when we know him intimately, we know his heart. What pleases him? What displeases him? What doesn't make him happy? Now, it's good to know the Ten Commandments, but it's better to know the heart of God. Because when you know his heart, you know what pleases him, what, disple what displeases him. It's okay, you get ten commandments are there. But when you know his heart, you say, even if there's not written there in one of those commandments, I know that this thing doesn't please God or this thing pleases him. Because you know him. You know his heart. You know what pleases him, what does not please him. To know him intimately also means to know his ways. To know that he has, his ways are ways of truth. His ways are ways of justice. His ways are ways of compassion. His ways are ways of mercy. That, that's, that's the ways of God. Those are the ways of God. And, and it all flows together. He's not giving us an option. Okay, you choose my goodness, but don't bother about my justice or my truth. No, it's, it flows together. Somehow, grace and truth flow together. And it's not either or. It's both flow together in God. So you, when we know him intimately, we begin to understand his ways. And we are able to walk those ways as we go through life, as we relate to people, as we deal with various situations in life. To know him intimate, intimately also means to know his power. So how great God is. You know, how big, how powerful, how wonderful he is. It's, just, it's also to know that, to know him. But we must all understand, and I think we'll all agree, that this is a journey we are making. It's not, I read one book, so I know everything about God. No, it's a journey. It's a lifelong journey. Till our last moment, we'll still be learning, discovering, understanding, growing in our knowing of him. It's a lifelong journey of discovery, knowing God. And so... And now this morning, uh, I just want to share a few thoughts here about knowing him intimately. Primarily focusing on why we should know him and spend a little bit more time on how to pursue God. How should we pursue him in order to know him intimately? I want to just share with us two simple reasons on why we need to know God intimately. Why? Why? We know he's infinite. And why should we keep pressing in to know him more and more? Why should we know him intimately? First reason. Because our strength or our true strength comes through knowing him intimately. True strength. I'm not talking about physical strength. It's the stuff that you go get in the gym. <laughs> You're talking about true inner strength comes through knowing him intimately. Right. 
and the strength is essential for you and me to stand through adversity, to stand through challenges in life. We need the strength even to do great things for God. We all want to do something meaningful, something significant. Some of us want to do great things for God. Where will you and I get that strength to do those things? The Bible says, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, the latter part of that verse, it says, the people, let's read it together, the people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Carry out great exploits. The people who know their God, they will be strong. So our true strength comes from knowing God. When you know him, there is strength in you, inside you. To stand through the storms, to go through life. And there is strength in you to actually do great exploits. So the Bible is full of stories of men and women who did great things. And where did they get that strength from? Their strength came from knowing God. The reason David could face Goliath was because he said, Goliath, I know you're big, but my God is bigger, infinitely bigger. So I could face, I could go face Goliath. The reason Daniel could you know, just be strong, even when he knew that if he prayed, he's going to be thrown into a den of lions. He wasn't afraid. He still prayed. He wouldn't let that deter him from praying. And he knew God will take care of me. And God did. The reason the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow their knee, even when the king commanded. Sorry. Because we know our God. He's well able to take care of us. So throughout the Bible, men and women who knew their God were strong. And they did great exploits. So our true strength comes through that knowledge of God, through knowing Him intimately. Second reason. True fruitfulness comes from knowing him. True fruitfulness comes from knowing him intimately. Jesus put it like this in John 15. I think it was 4. He said, let's read it together. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now, for many of us, without Jesus, we can do a lot of things. We have done a lot of things. What's he, what he's saying there? You see, true fruitfulness comes out of our intimacy, out of a place of abiding in him and him abiding in us. When you and I want to do things that will last it for eternity, will have eternal consequences, will have eternal significance, those kinds of things come out of a place of intimacy with him. He says, you abide in me. I abide in you. Then you will be very fruitful. So fruitfulness, of course we have to work hard. We have to be diligent. We have to work intelligently. All of that is there. But true fruitfulness comes out of that place of abiding in him. So why is it important to know him intimately? Because your true strength comes from him. Your true fruitfulness comes out of that place of knowing him. So, I want us to understand that there is a very, very, very simple secret to know him. Very simple. There's nothing complicated. No magic formula. To know him, we must pursue him. To know him, we must pursue him. That's it. So do I have to do 25 different things? <laughs> no. To know him, pursue him. 
in Jeremiah chapter 29, I think it was 12 and 13. He says, says it like this. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart. So as you go pray, you call. You seek me, you will find me. But there's a little clause there. If you do it with all your hearts. So God is seemingly playing hide and seek with us. So like God, you seem to be so hard to find. <laughs> the reason he seemingly appears hard to find is because he is inviting us to a place where we seek him. With all our hearts. That's how he wants us to pursue him. He says, you will seek me, you will find me. But you've got to search for me with all your heart. You know, play hide and seek. Say, well, I can't find the guy. What did you do? I just walked around and I can't find him. Well, search a little bit more. <laughs> Have you checked there? Have you checked there? You know? Go after it. So God is saying, look, if you seek me, you'll find me, but you've got to come after me with all your heart. Seek me. So in order to know him, we must pursue him. So if you want to know who he is, pursue him. If you want to know his heart, pursue him. If you want to know his ways, pursue him. If you want to know his power, pursue him. Pursue him. Go after him. So the simple things we engage in in order to pursue God, we take time to read his word. Now when you read the Bible, don't read the Bible as one of the things I need to do today. Done? Now I can have my breakfast. <laughs> no. But when you read the Bible, read it as though you are reading God's love letters to you. In those good old days, people used to write letters. And some people used to write love letters. <laughs> and you just have to imagine. The lady waiting for that love letter. When the letter comes, she is excited. She doesn't take the, and put it under the pillow. <laughs> I'll read it some other time. No. It's like she, she can hardly wait to open it. And she reads it with so much excitement. And then probably within the hour, she's read it ten times. The same letter. <laughs> And maybe to the course of the day, another ten times. Because he or she, they're trying to capture all the emotion. They're trying to capture everything that's supposedly coming with that letter. Something beyond just the words. So when you read the Bible, read it like God's love letter to you. I want you to think about this. That when you read the Bible, you're actually pleasing his heart. Because now, he's watching you respond to his love. Yeah. They're reading my Bible. They're reading the words I've given. You say, but why the Bible? God just chose to communicate to us in ways that you and I can understand. Because he's so great. So infinite. He had to put his thoughts down. His his. his his truth down in a way that you and I can comprehend it. And so he's given us his word. And so when you and I read his word. You read it as a love letter. And you are pleasing the heart of God. When you read his words. When you pray. Or when you praise. Or when you worship. Or maybe you just sit in his presence. Just have some nice 
you know, worship music going on and just being still, trying to listen to him or let him just work in you. Whatever way you are engaging in your pursuit of God, do it. But in order to know him, you have to pursue him. And this pursuit of God, I want to talk a little bit about that. Just share about six statements on that this morning. Very quickly, probably give you one verse of scripture to, uh, for, on each of these statements. So we pursue him by reading, meditating in his word. We pursue him through prayer, through praise, through worship and quietness. We pursue him by living in obedience to him. And here's how we we. We're supposed to. Here's how we pursue him. Number one. To know him intimately, pursue him passionately. So let's say it together. To know him intimately, pursue him passionately. I mean, there's got to be this, there's got to be a passion in you and me in our pursuit of God. The psalmist put it like this in Psalm 63, and many of these are all familiar verses in Scripture to us. He says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Notice those words. I seek you. I thirst for you. I long for you. Those are words he's using to describe uh, the intensity of his feelings for God. Passion. You know when you see little kids going out to play soccer or cricket. Or maybe they're in school. They're, wait, they're waiting for the bell to ring. <laughs> because then they can go out and play. Right? So five minutes before the bell, they may be nodding in class. But when the bell rings, they come alive, take the ball, run to the fields. And off they are playing soccer. Right? And there is so much of passion in it. Sometimes three hours can go by, for them it's like three minutes. Time flies when you're doing something you're passionate about. They don't stop to say, oh, I've played for 15 minutes, another two hours, 45 minutes to go. No. It's, man, the more time I have in this, the, I enjoy it. So they just lost in it. That's passion. Now, how about that passion in our pursuit of God? To know him intimately, we must pursue him passionately. Oh, God, thank you. I have this time in your presence. God, this is just wonderful. Uh, I'm excited, God. And, you know, whatever. Whether you're reading the Bible, whether you're praying, whether you're worshiping, or whether you're singing, or whether you're just being still. God, thank you. I enjoy this. Passion. Second, to know him intimately, we must pursue him wholeheartedly. Let's say it together. To know him intimately, pursue him wholeheartedly. Jesus captured it like this. He said, Mark 12, 29, 30, he says, Here is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I mean, it's a whole being is involved in your pursuit of God. Wholeheartedly. Our mind, our thoughts, our emotions are engaged. Every part of it. So it's not just my spirit, but my mind, my intellect, my thought, and my body. Everything involved in the pursuit of God. I bring my whole person in. God, I'm here to pursue God. You know, it's like, okay, I send my spirit, mind, and body somewhere else. <laughs> Whole person. I remember when I was in college, I had a good Korean friend, John Lee. <laughs> so one day we were just staying over in a friend's place. And so 
and uh, John, it was the evening, John was reading a book. Uh, he was lying down reading a book by John Stott, the great Christian author. He was reading. And he fell asleep reading it. <laughs> His face in the book. Next morning I woke up and John was in the same position. I said, you know, when he woke up, I said, John, what happened? Oh, then he realized, oh, no, no, I was just soaking it in. <laughs> now, that's an example of not being wholehearted. <laughs> you know, so it's not like, man, my spirit is seeking God, my mind and body somewhere else. No, your whole being is involved in your pursuit of God wholeheartedly. God, I, I want you. I desire for you. Number three, to know him intimately, pursue him intently. That means with focus. You're focused. You're zeroed in on him. The psalmist captured it like this. He said, Psalm 27, verse 4 and 8, he says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The uh, King James would say to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. So this is one thing. And I just want to gaze upon the Lord. Not glance, but gaze. So there's a difference. Well, I just saw him, just glanced. No, I gaze. When you're gazing on the Lord, there is focus. You're pursuing him intently. All your attention is on him. Now for all of us today, this is a big problem. It's such a huge problem. They're writing books on it. You know, Carl Newport, he's talking about deep learning. When you want to learn, he's saying, forget, get off social media. Now, this is a professor, a very well-respected professor. Get off social media. He's, forget Facebook. Don't, you know, because he says, uh, all these things have weakened our ability to learn. So this new thing called deep learning. What it simply means is, what all our grandfathers, all our grandparents were telling us. Cal Newport is writing books on it. <laughs> Basically saying, sit and stay focused for an extended period of time. That's what our grandparents told us. <laughs> all distractions, put it away. You know. So now, the same thing affects us when we are seeking God. Every 15 minutes, there is an itch to check the phone. <laughs> oh, no message. Okay. Back to reading the Bible. <laughs> Another 15 minutes, I got to check my phone. Sorry, God. <laughs> but that's distraction. It's disturbing our focus. Osama said, I will gaze on the beauty of the Lord. I mean, I'm intent, I'm focused, I'm keeping all distractions away. One thing I desire, one thing I will seek, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. So, to know him intimately, we need to pursue him intently. So you choose to do that. Keep those distractions away. God, I'm going to focus on you as I pursue you. This is my expression of my pursuit of you. I'm keeping these distractions away. I want to be intent, focused as I come, whether to pray or to read the Bible or worship or whatever, uh, however you're doing it. Number four, to know him Intimately pursue him earnestly. That is, we are sincere in this. We're not doing it, you know, to kind of fulfill some religious obligation. We're not doing it because pastor is going to check on me next Sunday. <laughs> no, we're not doing it for any of those reasons. 
It's sincere. It's coming out of a genuine heart. Jesus put it like this in John 4, 23, 24. He says, the hour is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Sincerity. Being genuine. Earnest. In your pursuit of God. So to know him intimately, pursue him earnestly. So, don't do it. Oh, if I don't spend 15 minutes today, God will be angry. I'll just disturb his mood. And then he won't be good to me today. No, that's not it. Or, I need to look good before people. Or no, no, None of that. We pursue him. Because we genuinely want him, desire him, want to know him more. Genuinely. Number five, to know him intimately, pursue him sacrificially. That means it'll cost us something. You need to put things aside, sacrifice a few things in order to make space in your life to pursue him. Look at a simple example here in Matthew 14 in the life of Jesus. He had just finished healing multitudes. He had just finished feeding thousands of people. What does he do next? Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. So he made space. I'm sure each one of those 5,000 people would have wanted to come to Jesus and shake his hands and say, thanks for the meal. I'm sure, you know, the 12 disciples, now they are all, each one carrying a huge basket. So Jesus, would you like to come home and we'll just continue this meal? <laughs> do something. I, I, this time for celebration. But what did Jesus do? Guys, I just want you to get in the boat. Just go to the other side. We'll meet later. Crowds, thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed the dinner. See you tomorrow. <laughs> or whatever. Sent the multitudes away. And he withdrew. By himself to go and pray. And so for you and, for you and me, we need to make space. And that may mean sacrificing some things. Maybe time you may have spent in recreation, time spent some other way. You sacrifice it because you want that time to be with him. To pursue him. So that you can know him intimately. So to know him intimately, you sacrifice, pursue him sacrificially. Last one. To know him intimately, pursue him expectantly. That means with expectation that God, as I pray, as I read my Bible or as I just sit here in this and place with this music uh, going on and worshiping you, whatever, how you're engaging with God, Lord, I'm expecting to encounter you. Not like, oh man, I just got to get through this, hope my prayers cross the ceiling, you know. <laughs> no. It's not that you're just doing something that, you know, hoping it may work better. No, I'm doing it with expectation. A few days back, I just began reading the Gospel of Matthew. Not for the first time. But <laughs> <laughs> I just read sequentially, so I finished Malachi and I was starting Matthew. And uh, so I usually just read sequentially. So reading Matthew chapter 1, and you know how it all begins. With the genealogy. Now, many times you skip the genealogy, start from verse 21 or something, you know. <laughs> but I was just reading the genealogy. I just read till about verse 17. Just finished the genealogy part. 
And, and this is true. I'm not making this up. I just read the genealogy. Sitting at my table. Reading Matthew 1. Reading the genealogy. And the presence of God just came upon me so strong. I started crying. Just weeping. I just read the genealogy. But suddenly I was overwhelmed with this recognition that God is interested in our lineage. It just, just, just overwhelming. It, it was like heaven's opening. God, you're interested in our lineage. And I was just so overwhelmed. And I was crying. I was lost in that sense in the presence of God for several minutes. So what happened? Encountering God. Learning something more about Him. So what did you read today? I read genealogy. How many verses? 17. Not even one full chapter. Hey, but I encountered God. That's priceless. It's better than just reading 10 chapters not knowing what you read. That's priceless. I sat in that moment, soaked everything in. This is a revelation of God. Encountering God. Just knowing that much more of Him. So now when I say God is interested in, gene, in our lineage, it, it, it is backed up with an encounter with God. It's not some statement I read somewhere or just saying it. No, no. Because that was a revelation. It, it was, came through that knowing Him intimately moments. I understand. So just, just reading the Bible, you encounter God. And he brings you a little bit closer, deeper, just to know him some, just a little bit more. And notice what Hosea says in Hosea chapter 6 in verse 3. He put it like this, he says, let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. So let's go after this. Let's pursue knowing him. Let's pursue. His going forth is established as the morning. That is, when we pursue knowing him, his response is certain. As certain as the morning comes. There's no doubt about There's no question on this. His going forth is established as the morning. What's his response? He will come to us like the rain. So when we pursue knowing him, what's his response? And this is a very definite response. He will come to us like the rain. Rain that brings refreshing. Rain that brings renewing. Rain that brings reviving. He will come to us like the rain. Like the former rain, uh, like the latter and the former then rain that comes during seed time and the rain that comes during harvest. He will come to us like that. To cause our lives to be fruitful. To cause our lives to be renewed. But he says, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord, of knowing him. He will come to us. So, just to sum up, to know him, we must pursue him. But here's how we must pursue him. We must pursue him. Let's read it together. Passionately, wholeheartedly, intently, earnestly, sacrificially, and expectantly. Pursue him like this. Pursue him like this. Not casually, lazily. Sleepily. <laughs> no. Pursue him. Passionately. Wholeheartedly. Intently. Earnestly. Sacrificially. And expectantly. God, here's how I'll push. 
and he will do amazing things through our lives. I just want to remind you about two people in the history of the church. And I'm not sharing this to intimidate us. I'm just sharing this as true stories that happen. Evan Roberts, 1904. was 26 years of age. Raised up the son of a coal miner. Grew up in the coal mines. Hardly any, edu any education. Nothing much to his life. At the age of 26, and his young age, so he, was, he spent his youth seeking God. But he, he became so desperate in his seeking God that he pushed it to seeking God in prayer and in the reading of the word like for seven hours a day. And he began to cry to God, saying, God, give me 100,000 souls. Now, that's, it's like, that can never happen. Can never happen. How can a young man like this, who has no education, nothing, impact 100,000 lives? How can it be? But what did God do? One day in October of well, he was 26 years of age, 1904. I think it was October 17th. He came, he was speaking to a little youth group, few people, few, few people, I don't know, 12 or 20 small youth group of people. And something happened. God just began to move. And that meeting went on for days. And then hundreds, of thousands of people started coming. There was no social media. None of those things that we used to promote events. None of those things. Just a work of God. Then the newspapers began to report on this. The streets were blocked. Traffic jams happened even in those days. <laughs> but it was happening because of the revival. People were coming to the church. Or to the place where the meeting was happening. And it is recorded. The newspapers recorded this. I think within a period of six months, more than 250,000 lives were changed. The people who know their God will be strong and do great things, something that just wasn't humanly possible happened. All of Wales was lit up by this revival, the work of God's spirit. And then it went to other nations. One young man decided he was going to pursue God intently. Pursue God with passionately. The same thing happened, the story of William Seymour, 1906. This was in the United States. And he was a black preacher. He had one eye. Uh, a very disadvantageous position because he couldn't, when he went to Bible school, he couldn't even sit in the main room. He had to sit outside in the window, in an aisle outside the main classroom for him to just listen to the lectures. It's a very disadvantageous position. But he decided he was going to seek God. And for three and a half years, he spent five hours a day seeking God. And he wasn't satisfied with it for, so that so the next two years he moved it up to seven hours a day. He was so desperate. But then something happened. You and I know the story. 1906. Azusa Street. He landed up there to take on the responsibility of a church. They locked him out after the first sermon. So imagine. A pastor gets locked out of his church after his first sermon. Some family nearby took him into their home. And one day, in that home, during a time of family prayer, devotion, there was suddenly the Holy Spirit moved. And people just started coming. But day after day, they moved that to another place. And, 
and the rest is history. And the, uh, the, they moved it to a, 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 a run-down building on the corner of Azusa Street. And, and the meetings just took, just God just started moving powerfully. People from all around the world started coming to this place. And uh, every Pentecost, so the Pentecostal movement was birthed out of it. And every Pentecostal denomination, whether it's the Assemblies of God or the Holiness, Pentecost, Pentecostal Holiness or whatever, they all trace their roots back to Azusa streets. One man, very disadvantageous position in life. He sought God. And even today, we are feeling the effects of his prayer. Of his pursuit of God. Amen. Now, I don't want to intimidate you, so Pastor. Five hours, seven hours, not me. <laughs> That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, I just want you to see the result of pursuing God. What can God do in your life, through your life, through my life, if we just pursue him a little bit more? What can God do? So this morning, let's call our worship team up, please. This morning, I want to leave this in with us. Let's know him intimately. But to know him, we must pursue him. Pursue him passionately. Pursue him wholeheartedly. Pursue him intently. Pursue him earnestly. Pursue him sacrificially. Pursue him expectantly. God will do something in your life. If you pursue him. He will. Hosea said, his going forth is established as the morning. I mean, his response is certain. He will come to us like the rain. It's certain. He will do it. But would you and I make a little space in our lives, a little time in our lives to just seek him a little bit more? A little bit more. A little bit more. Now the Holy Spirit will help us do this. Holy Spirit will help us. So this morning, all I want to encourage, request you and me to do is just ask the Holy Spirit, God, give me that grace to pursue you that I might know you. Give me that grace. You empower me, Holy Spirit. You help me to do this. Because my own strength is limited. My own ability is limited. But you help me, Holy Spirit. Give me the grace. You help me just a little bit more just to pursue God. And I'm sure Holy Spirit will help you. Will help me to pursue Him so that we can know Him. Amen. If you want to rise up to your feet, you're welcome. But just ask the Lord to help. Let's pray. Let's ask. The more I seek you, The more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you, the more I seek you, the more I seek you. from
Father, we just pray your grace. We pray, Father, for the empowering of your Holy Spirit on each of our lives to enable us to pursue you. Give us the grace, each one of us, to seek you, Father. Do the unusual. Do the unexpected in each of our lives. Break off all the ceilings, all the limitations, all the things that restrain us, O oh God. Set us free. To pursue you like never before. Do this, Father, for each of us. Let each of us experience, Lord, an unusual empowering in our lives to seek you. Let us find ourselves doing things we never thought we would do in pursuing you. We welcome you to do this for each of us. We thank you. Thank you, Father. We're going to close in a few moments. If you need prayer, 
We'll be available here to pray with you, pray for you personally. Take these words with you. Let these words become real in your life as you pursue God, as you seek Him. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Stores.